supporting this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That ends the debate on the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. We now move to the next item of business, which is a statement by Paul Wheelhouse on Scottish Greenhouse Gas Emissions Annual Target Report 2012. The Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I will give a few moments for everybody to settle. I now call on Paul Wheelhouse, Minister, around 10 minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, climate change is the biggest challenge facing global society today. It poses threats to both our way of life and the ecosystems in which we depend. The clarity of the case for the global community to step up its action to contain worldwide temperature increases to 2 degrees Celsius was strengthened with the publication this weekend of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Synthesis Report, which makes clear that if the world fails to act decisively, then the economic and social costs will be severe. The Scottish Government will play its full part in international efforts to bring global emissions down to a level consistent with containing increases in global average temperatures to 2 degrees Celsius or less. But let me say quite clearly, the targets that have been set for Scotland to help achieve that outcome are not only the Scottish Government's targets, they are Scotland's targets. When our World Leading Climate Change Act was passed unanimously by this Parliament, all MSPs took on the responsibility to deliver Scotland's targets. In that context, it's disappointing that, to date, uh, during budget negotiations, the three largest opposition parties have not come forward with any low-carbon suggestions as part of their budget asks. I cite this not to be ac accusatory, but rather to encourage members and parties in their future actions. I am therefore asking colleagues across Parliament today to rekindle the same unanimity shown when passing the Act and to strive to work in concert on this most important challenge. I believe we can deliver a consensus on the way forward and in doing so send the strongest possible signal to Scotland's people of both the necessity for change and the hope that change can be achieved. Last week I, I laid the annual report in Scotland's 2012 annual greenhouse gas emissions in Parliament. Let's be clear, Scotland is making good progress with a substantial net emissions reduction of 26.4 per cent from the 1990 baseline. This, it should be noted, compares with a 24.2 per cent reduction assumed when the 2012 target was, was set, based on the 1990 to 2008 greenhouse gas inventory. Or in other words, we were ahead of our target in percentage terms. Indeed, our actual unadjusted source emissions fell even further by 29.9 per cent over this period. These percentage reductions demonstrate we are over halfway to achieving the Climate Change Act interim target of reducing emissions by 42 per cent by 2020. However, as I told Parliament in June, that percentage decrease does not correspond to Scotland's statutory annual target, which is set in carbon tonnage terms. Achievement of Scotland's targets is formally measured against the level of the net Scottish emissions account, or NSEA. This accounts for the greenhouse gas emissions from sources in Scotland, Scotland's share of emissions from international aviation and shipping, the effect of any relevant emission removals, and the effect of sale and purchase of relevant carbon units, or tradable emission allowances. In 2012, the NSEA figure, after adjustment for the EU uh, ETS tradable allowances, was 55,665,180 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. This was 2,439,180 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, more than the statutory 2012 target. However, crucially, Scotland's actual or source emissions recorded in the same year were 52,895,245 tonnes of CO2 equivalent. This is 0.33 megatons better than the target. In 2011, similarly, source emissions were again lower than the statutory NSEA target. My statement today sets out the actions we are taking to redress the shortfall in abatement relative to the NSEA statutory targets and to keep Scotland on track to achieving the ambitions of the Climate Change Act. In June, in addition to further measures we took, I announced Cabinet had agreed to the creation of the, sub, the Scottish Government's Cabinet Subcommittee uh, on Climate Change. At our first meeting last week, we discussed actions Scotland is already taking to tackle climate change and how we can drive forward efforts to ensure Scotland remains on track to meet this Parliament's world-leading climate change ambitions. We have made significant progress against the low-carbon vision outlined in our second report on proposals and policies, as demonstrated in the RPP2 monitoring framework published earlier this year. We continue to lead the UK on renewable power with more than 46% of Scotland's gross electricity consumption generated from renewables in 2013. Scotland is on track to its interim target of 50% by 2015. 
We are also on track to meet Scotland-wide target to reduce energy consumption by at least 12% by 2020. Energy consumption in 2012 was 2.2% lower than in 2011 and 11% lower than the relevant baseline. In 2012, renewable heat generation equated to 3% of Scotland's non-electrical heat demand, up from 2.7% in 2011. In 2013, renewable heat capacity increased by 18% and heat generated from renewable sources by 17% compared with 2012. So we are making progress towards achieving our 2012 renewable heat target of 11%, albeit challenges remain. Forestry planting rates have increased with some 8,300 hectares planted in 2013-14, equating to around uh, 16 million trees. And we aim to raise rates to 20 million trees per year from 2015. We're phasing out biodegradable municipal waste going to landfill by 2020, the first ban among any administration in the UK. And by 2015, 64,000 tonnes of food waste per year will be diverted to anaerobic digestion or composting. On the Home Energy Efficiency Programme for Scotland, or HEAPS, we've gone beyond our original commitments. We estimate almost 20,000 private sector households will benefit from energy efficiency measures through HEAPS in 2013-14. And between 2013-14 and 2015-16... I'm sorry, Mr McNeill, this is a... Around a quarter one moment, Minister. I'm sorry, Mr McNeill, this is a statement. There's no interventions. Minister, continue. Between 2013-14 and 2015-16, we will spend around a quarter of a billion pounds on fuel poverty and energy efficiency. It is disappointing that the UK Government's flagship Green Deal policy has had limited take-up. However, Scotland accounts for a very large proportion of GBY delivery. The UK Government's changes to ECO announced last December and only confirmed after consultation this autumn created great uncertainty. The removal of part of the energy company obligation from bills has not resulted in UK Government fully backing funding, back funding energy efficiency measures. In, and in comparison, the Scottish Government have a centrally funded energy efficiency programme, enabling us to secure more than our pro rata share of ECO to date. The Cabinet subcommittee committed to work with officials on Climate Change Delivery Board to monitor progress on implementing RPP2 and, where necessary, to identify new abatement opportunities and to address excess cumulative emissions over the 2012 to 2012, 2010 to 2012 period. It is our intention that RPP2 will be delivered in full and where policies and proposals are not delivered, we agreed to look to bring forward new policies that would have the same if not greater level of emissions abatement. We will work collectively to scrutinise each portfolio for opportunities to support them in delivering their best contribution to tackling climate change and to ensure Scotland's ex example is as positive a one for others to emulate as possible. We would welcome and indeed encourage other parties in this Parliament to come forward with constructive, positive suggestions we can all support to keep Scotland on track and accelerate our transition to a, low, a successful low-carbon economy. The Cabinet Subcommittee is clear that we must significantly accelerate and focus our domestic efforts if we are to avoid dangerous climate change. But RPP2 only takes us to 2027. Last week I was able to set out for the Cabinet Subcommittee the steps we intend to take to deliver the next report on proposals and policies, or RPP3. Preparatory work has already commenced in the production of the next RPP, due for publication in 2016, and we aim to lay the next RPP as soon as reasonably practical. Uh, this will be a complex, wide-ranging project necessary to ensure that the final report is sufficiently robust to remain relevant for at least five years. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Sustainable Growth has already agreed to fund a new macroeconomic modelling capability to help in the preparation of RPP3, and we anticipate this model will be available for use by early autumn next year. Our independent advisers, the Committee on Climate Change, earlier this year advised that underlying progress remains on track in most sectors. As I've mentioned, the key factor now impacting on Scotland's ability to meet annual targets is upward revisions to the baseline against which our targets are measured, although the EU's failure uh, to agree greater pre-2020 ambition is also a concern. By summer 2014, the baseline had been revised up by 5.4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent compared to the data available when the annual targets were first set. Revisions are the result of improvements in methodology, as there are more accurate monitoring of emissions and understanding of the impact of greenhouse gases improves over time. As a result of these revisions, the fixed annual targets are now considerably more challenging than when they were set and may get, yet get harder still. We remain committed to delivering a 42% reduction by 2020 and a minimum of an 80% reduction by 2050. However, overcoming methodological issues arising from improvements in data and estimation techniques rather than material changes in emissions remains challenging, not least because changes are not notified until after the year being measured. 
At the end of this month, I'm meeting the new CEO of the Committee for Climate Change, uh, Matthew Bell, when he visits Scotland. And I'll be asking Mr Bell how the Independent Committee on Climate Change can best help us address the challenges Scotland faces in delivering on our annual as well as our longer term targets. I know that the RACI Committee has been looking to help in this matter. Several independent experts and I also gave evidence to, to that committee earlier this month and I very much look forward to receiving the report of the RACI Committee on its inquiry into RPP2. Presiding officer, climate change is a reality. It is happening now. Uh, the Scottish Government are committed to working with Parliament, civil society, the business community and the people of Scotland to deliver Scotland's world-leading greenhouse gas uh, emission targets. Scotland is making good progress, but I also agree more needs to be done. Perhaps the greatest leverage Scotland can have in tackling global climate change is by using Scotland as an international exemplar of both ambition and delivery, even when it's tough to do so. Presiding officer, I call on all in this parliament to recognise Scotland's progress, recognise the scale of challenge Scotland faces, and to join with us in showing the leadership and the teamwork Scotland expects and needs in facing up to the climate challenge. Let's be a true example to the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we will now take questions on issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for questions, after which we move to next business. It would be helpful now if members who wish to speak could press the request to speak button and I call Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. I thank the Minister for an advanced copy of his statement. Uh, we can all spin the statistics one way or on another, but we can't get away from this being the third year in a row we've had to analyse why we are missing the statutory targets, and that is hugely disappointing. In fact, actual emissions have increased between 2011 and 2012, and we know that the first three targets were the easiest to hit, and that the next one is always going to be very challenging. The actual drop in emissions needed for us to meet the next target is greater than the total number that was needed for the first three, so we are in a difficult place. But just as it was last year, it is clear that we do have the potential to meet the targets if the government would use the levers it currently has to make a difference. Every year that the target is missed, it is more difficult to achieve the low carbon economy that we all want to see in this chamber. Um, to use the Minister's phrase, not to be accusatory, but Labour have, in this session, asked for over £300 million during the budget process to be allocated to housing and retrofitting. Um, I know the government is in trouble when it starts to ask for consensus, but if the government were to bring forward the step change needed, we would, of course, be willing to work with them. Um, the Cabinet subcommittee must be more than just a talking shop. We need to see concrete policies emerge from it. One thing that is missing from this statement is new proposals, particularly in housing and transport, which are identified as the weak points. Does the Minister have any confidence in the Government's ability to meet the 2013 target or any yearly targets up to 2020? Minister. Well, Presiding Officer, I, I, I'm afraid I, um, I'm disappointed in Claire Baker's response to the question. Uh, we put down a pretty open goal there for consensus to be built around this issue. Uh, but it has to be said that, um, once again, Claire Baker has displayed a misunderstanding of the nature of the statistics. I've made very clear that we have had a 7.7% increase in the business-as-usual projection for the Scot Scottish economy in terms of climate change targets. And if uh, Ms Baker is unable to understand the basis on which that impacts on our performance to hit fixed statutory targets, then I, I'm afraid that um, that is a matter for Ms Baker to resolve. But in terms of... If, if Ms Baker wants to ask further questions, she can do so, but uh, from a sedentary position, it's difficult for me to answer original questions. Um, Ms Baker has, has made a point about new proposals. I do welcome her comment about uh, being willing to seek cons consensus, and I think it's a strength of the Act. I've used this example in international fora when, when discussing the issue of Scotland's performance and Scotland's legislative framework with colleagues around the world, and they genuinely admire Scotland for the fact we had a political consensus in 2009. I don't think it's too late to recreate that. I hope this is a one-off blip and perhaps um, Claire Baker is wanting to get, get her punches in early, but I do hope that we have the chance to work together to try and deliver on very stretching targets. If the Labour Party are sincere about wishing to be an alternative government in Scotland, they will face exactly the same challenges the Scottish Government does today with the methodological issues that I have outlined in my statement, and therefore it is important that we work together to try and get round that and work in a way that we can develop a strategy together to achieve our targets. That is in everyone's interest, but I do welcome her comment about willing to be part of a consensus of if we can achieve that, and I hope that we can do that after today. Jamie McGregor. Thank you. Um, recent figures show that the poorest one-fifth of the UK population spend 11% of their income on energy, and it's probably more than that in Scotland. So reducing emissions from the residential sector, which are so influenced by cold snaps, especially here in Scotland, must continue to be a priority. 
Is the Minister happy that enough is being done to improve the energy efficiency of Scotland's existing housing stock and that adequate funding is in place to achieve this? And can he provide any updates on what progress is being made in helping elderly and vulnerable residents in the most remote and rural areas uh, access support for energy efficiency schemes? And is the Minister aware of WWF's concern that the Scottish Government is not doing enough to support district heating and combined heat and power projects? Does he have any plans to do more in that area? And finally, uh, can the Minister uh, give us any update on progress in the carbon capture and storage sector? Thank you. Minister, I hope Mr McGregor has left some questions for other members. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best to answer them as quickly as possible, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, the first thing to say is I certainly recognise the point that Mr McGregor makes about the importance of tackling residential emissions. It's a very large share of Scotland's emissions. It's one that's proving quite persistent in terms of the level of emissions we have uh, per capita in Scotland, and therefore it's an, an important area for us to target uh, for action, not least because of the fuel poverty issue that, that Mr McGregor quite rightly highlights as being a key consideration. Uh, it is encouraging, though, I, I should say, that in respect of Scotland's Housing Conditions Survey, we know that by the end of 2011, 88% of loss had at least 100 millimetres of insulation and 54% uh, had 200 millimetres or more, and two-thirds of properties that had a cavity wall, including my own house, had, have been uh, fitted with cavity wall insulation. So there are a good signs for progress. We are making a lot of progress. Housing colleagues are working very hard and indeed now trying to look how we go to the harder to treat properties in rural and island communities where that is a, a serious challenge, as I'm sure the member recognises, with solid wall construction and, and non-conventional construction techniques. So uh, in that respect, HEAPS, which has got a large component of £60 million of the £79 million in the current year, has been allocated to area-based schemes. And within that, we've specifically allocated, uh, in discussion with NGOs, some money to target those hard-to-treat properties in rural and island communities. So I assure the member we take it very seriously. On district heating, my colleague Fergus Ewing is working hard to develop a uh, heat mapping in Scotland and to take forward a potential uh, framework for, for a more rapid rollout of, of, uh, of heat and uh, district heating. And that's something that I'm sure we can uh, keep in contact with the member on. Thank you. Uh, Angus MacDonald, followed by Claudia Beamish. Thank you, President Officer. Will the Minister join with me in welcoming what seems to be EU agreement to reduce EU domestic greenhouse gas emissions by at least 40% below the 1990 level by 2030? And can the Minister provide assurances that the Scottish Government will continue to work with other ambitious countries in making the transition towards a low-carbon economy? Minister. Um, well, absolutely. I certainly agree with Angus MacDonald that um, we, we should welcome the package that's been announced. It's not perhaps as far as many of us would have liked it to go, uh, but we do have uh, an offer on the table from the EU of 40%, as the member states, uh, and with the potential open opportunity, if there is a global deal, to per perhaps go beyond 40%. The Scottish Government and the UK Government together have taken a consistent view that uh, up to 50% should be offered in the event of a global deal uh, for 2030. And as the member probably knows, Scotland is already uh, a target of 58% by 2027. So we have already put our cards on the table and are hoping others will follow our, our ambitious lead. Um, but the EU has made that move. I want to pay tribute to Connie Hedegaard, the uh, Commissioner, uh, who has worked extremely hard to strike that deal. It's I'm no, uh, probably not as far as she would have liked it to go either, but it's, it's progress nonetheless. And I hope that we can see genuine progress, not only on the mitigation target, but I hope we can go further on the energy efficiency and renewable targets as well, which are perhaps more, more modest than the Scottish Government would have liked. Claudia Beamish, followed by Rob Gibson. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, I, I am concerned um, that the minister no longer seems to think that the annual targets are important, difficult as they are to meet, um, perhaps because they are a, a challenge to achieve. Yes, the changes to the 1990 baseline means that 42% reduction figure is more achievable in 2020. But does the minister agree with me that the yearly targets are still important and send a significant message um, beyond Scotland? Minister? Absolutely. I'm, I'm delighted to, to collect the impression I may have given in my earlier response to Claire Baker on that, on that point. I agree entirely with Claudia Beamish. While these are difficult targets because of the methodological changes, we are still trying to hit them. It's, it's, it's important that we strive to, to achieve these targets because Parliament gave a clear intent when they set the targets that these were important targets to meet. And they are, uh, aside from fuel poverty, a very rare beast, uh, statutory annual targets that we have. So we, we have to try and achieve them. Um, what I was trying to set out in my earlier response is the fact that it is becoming more challenging in practical sense to, to achieve those targets as they were expressed 
in the target, but the Parliament's intent when the Act was, was, uh, was passed was to achieve 42% by 2020 and at least 80% by 2050. I mean, absolutely, uh, unequivocally, uh, are sticking to those targets, and we will do what we can to meet the annual targets between now and 2020. I do recognise the point that Ms Baker made about the difficulty between 2013 and 2020 in achieving those targets, but we, it's the purpose of the Cabinet Subcommittee is to try and get us back on track to achieving even those targets if we can. Rob Gibson, followed by Tavis Scott. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Greenhouse Gas Emissions Report 2012 says that residential emissions in 2012 were increased by cooler temperatures and by changes in the fuel mix for electricity production. Could Scotland's emissions tumble if UK energy policy uh, allows a more speedy uh, renewable electricity development instead of the Tory fixation with the dash for unconventional gas. Minister. Well, yeah, um, I certainly agree with Rob Gibson that uh, you know, Scotland has a huge opportunity in renewables. Uh, we have uh, the great opportunity to deliver uh, you know, sustainable energy for the future. And it is a pity that we do have at the present, even though we have achieved very impressive 46.4% of our electricity generation or electricity demand, sorry, being met in, uh, in, in, in 2013 from renewables, we are perhaps not achieving as much as we could do if we had a more supportive environment at a UK level uh, for investment in renewables. That's not, again, to be accusatory, but it would be helpful if we had a more supportive regime in terms of transmission charges. The hydro industry has particular concerns about digression rates uh, in terms of support from uh, UK government, and that's something that has been raised by Fergus Ewing uh, with the UK ministers. And, uh, of course, the dash for a £35 billion support for a nuclear power station at Inkley Point is something that we deeply regret. We think it's a wrong decision and it will lock uh, higher energy prices in for the future. Uh, we also are concerned the fact that the House of Lords has removed Scotland's ability to vary rocks um, at a very important time for the industry and we think that breaches the spirit of respect for Scotland and indeed uh, flies in the face of some of the statements in the, re in the, in the wake of the referendum about uh, giving more power to Scotland. Tavish Scott, followed by Maureen Watt. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, the Minister has clarified that the targets are indeed important. Would he therefore clarify why the Cabinet subcommittee that he mentions only met once since June, and that was, as he said, just last week? How many times does it plan uh, to meet in the forthcoming uh, months, and how important is its uh, role? And would he also uh, clarify for Parliament this uh, accept conundrum for him that, uh, that uh, does he replace the existing policy mechanisms he has under, the, I grant you, the existing devolution settlement, or is he looking at new initiatives? And if so, I wasn't clear from his statement as to what exactly they, they might be. Minister. Well, I, th I think uh, in relation to the cap Cabinet subcommittee point, um, clearly uh, we are taking this particularly seriously. It's taken a while to set up and, and, and to uh, define the papers, the initial papers that were going to the Cabinet sub subcommittee. Uh, we agreed that the Cabinet subcommittee would try and meet before the end of the year because of the urgency of the issue. So uh, while in, in, in normal practice there might be three or four meetings a year, we're going to try and have a, a shorter gap to the next one because we have a lot of work to get on with us. I'm sure the member appreciates. In terms of the, uh, the issue that was mentioned in relation to the targets and the, and the approach we may take to addressing that issue. I think we, we, we need to have a conversation, as I say, with uh, the incoming uh, Chief Executive of the Committee on Climate Change, who, who are our, our advisors, independent advisors, about what they recommend, both in terms of increased domestic effort, which is one of the two things they highlighted in their earlier report in March, and indeed um, what technical uh, measures they might suggest, or none, um, to attack uh, the, the issue that we've raised in terms of the methodological changes, which are important to recognise because they do improve the quality of the information we have available to us. So I'm not denying they have to take place. It's important we have as accurate an understanding as possible of our emissions and progress we are making, but they do present us some difficulties with the Act as currently constituted. So we'll look to, to get advice from the Committee on Climate Change and then obviously report back to Parliament when, uh, when we've had that uh, as to what the messages are that we've been given. But um, I, I take the point the Member is making. The Cabinet Subcommittee is a large Cabinet Subcommittee, one of the largest I believe that the Scottish Government has ever had, and it has a cross-disciplinary feel to it, and there was good engagement from colleagues at the meeting, including Mr Mackay, who's, who's joined us today uh, for this session, and uh, I look forward to having the next meeting in December. What do you want, followed by Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Building on Jamie McGregor's point about our emissions from housing stock and the need to improve uh, insulation and fitting renewable energy alternatives in homes, can I ask what the steps the Scottish Government is taking to assist people understand how changing their behaviours can also help tackle climate change? Minister. 
Well, it's a very important uh, point that, that Maureen Watt raises because we know roughly about half the change that we have to achieve as a nation is through behavioural change and therefore it's, it puts great emphasis on the efforts we're taking under the Greener Together campaign uh, which uh, since January 2012 has highlighted the actions people can take themselves to help us uh, deliver on our climate change targets. We're doing really important work through the uh, Climate Challenge Fund and I was delighted this week to uh, be able to announce uh, the 500th community which happened to be in Falkirk, uh, Mr McDonald's constituency and, and uh, close to um, uh, the central belt. Uh, we have 512 communities that have now taken positive action to deliver on climate change at a community level. So there are a number of things we can do. We're working with the business community through the Climate 2020 group. Uh, it's very important, high profile businesses, major listed companies in Scotland showing leadership and trying to come forward with their own ideas about how we can tackle climate change. So there is good room for optimism on that front. I think uh, we have with the political consensus we have in the parliament, I hope uh, we can maintain that unity and sense of purpose across civic Scotland, the business community, individuals and communities across Scotland, the length and breadth of the land to deliver on our targets. But the point is well made by uh, Maureen Watt, and I thank her for her question. Ken okay, McIntosh, followed by Graeme Day. Uh, thank you. And uh, the Minister will be aware and probably share the Chamber's disappointment that uh, carbon emissions from business and industry have been on the increase since 2009, uh, suggesting perhaps that any initial progress had less to do uh, with any embedded commitment to change than the economic downturn and perhaps more worryingly that any future economic growth may add additional pressures. Can I ask the Minister why has the Scottish Government uh, had such little success in reducing emissions from business and industry? Minister. Well, I, th I think um, Ken McIntosh it's a, an important point. We, we certainly do see a close link between economic activity and emissions, and we've never denied that. I mean, certainly in terms of um, emissions that have happened, sadly, since the recession kicked in 2008-09, we were well aware that there were economic issues underlying perhaps a uh, drop-off in transport emissions and, and indeed uh, emissions in the business sector have also been affected. And in the longer term, since 1990, there have obviously been huge structural changes in the Scottish economy, as there have been across Western Europe, which have played a part in us achieving the relatively high percentage drop-off in emissions to date. But there are also important measures that have been taken, as I say, at local level, uh, at a government level, and indeed across sectors. And we shouldn't deny there has been good work being done uh, by the business community as well. That's why organisations like Resource Efficient Scotland and Zero Waste Scotland are very important, and SEPA, indeed, in guiding businesses as to what they can do to become more resource efficient, to reduce their carbon and, and to set an example as well as I think SEPA and other organisations within the uh, Scottish Government uh, family have done in terms of their own reporting on emissions and giving exemplars to uh, the business community as to how they can achieve more. But I don't deny that um, we need to do more with the business community. That's why it's so encouraging that the 2020 Climate Group are uh, very much supporting uh, the, this Parliament's aspirations to lower emissions and are playing a very positive role in coming up with their own ideas as to how they can achieve more. And let's not forget one very big business sector is the power sector, and they have dropped by over five megatons in the period since uh, 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 2007, I believe. And therefore, that is one of the biggest single contributions to our improved performance. Graeme Day, followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you. Can the Minister advise whether revision of the baseline is to be an ongoing process, which would mean that this chasing of a moving target, as Dr Uta Collier of the UK Climate Change Committee described the situ situation to the Rural Affairs Committee, will continue? And if that is the case, isn't there an argument for adjusting the short-term targets post-2015 and looking again at the trajectory through to 2032, whilst retaining our long-term ambitions? Minister. Well, uh, Mr Day is absolutely right. We know that uh, already in June 20, uh, 2015, uh, regardless of the outcome in terms of Scotland's own emission figures, uh, the inventory will be updated to increase the potency of methane as a gas uh, in terms of conversion to CO2 equivalent. So that's going to go from roughly 21 times the potency of CO2 to 25 times, and that will have an impact on emissions, perhaps in the agriculture sector, in the waste sector uh, as well, but both in baseline emissions and also uh, the adjusted emissions. So in some cases, it might actually be lower uh, now because of the changes and in others it might be higher. Um, we'll have to see the, the, the impact of that. But there will be ongoing adjustments. We hope to see one positive one in future, uh, more accurate information on peatlands, for example, which may well help uh, Scotland in terms of ha coming up with more, uh, more of a strategic tool to address our climate change emissions. So there, there are also positives as well as negatives. We've been very unlucky as a country that in the last three years we've had successive increases, whereas the UK has seen some decreases and some increases. Uh, we've had pretty much uh, across the board increases in, in emissions figures. So it's something we do have to discuss with the Committee on Climate Change, the impact it has both in terms of our RPP2 
which is clearly something which hasn't taken into account those most recent uh, revisions and also our ongoing strategy to address climate change in Scotland. So it's, it's something we're taking very seriously uh, and uh, it will keep the committee informed, of course, of, of the measures we take in that regard. Patrick Harvey, followed by Cara Hilton. Thank you. Since before the Act passed, I've been concerned about this myth of Scotland's consensus on climate change. Yes, we all voted for the targets, but there was never consensus on how to reach them or indeed on the relative priority compared with other economic priorities. Can the Minister tell us what he means when he tells us today that RPP2 will be delivered in full? Does he mean that everything presented there as a policy or as a proposal will in fact happen? And in particular, will he heed the call to ensure that energy efficiency of the housing stock is designated as a national infrastructure priority project? I think um, it's an important point that Patrick Harvey raises, and I apologise if I've given any confusion as to, to the statement I've given today. What we are trying to say is that we, we appreciate the, the policies and proposals that are set out in RPP2, we, that we have to strive to achieve those. Now, if for some reason one proposal uh, cannot be converted to policy or there's a problem implementing a particular policy we've already adopted, then we need to, as a government to find a way to make up that shortfall in emissions. So the responsibility is on uh, us all within government to, to try and share that burden and find a way, of, way through that. So in terms of delivering it in full, I mean that we need to deliver the abatement that we have set out regardless of how we do it. And we need to try and ensure that uh, we come up with compensatory measures if something is prevented from happening or as uh, we have discovered in terms of our, uh, and it's probably to be fair to Mr Harvey, I think it may be a point he made during RPP2 passage, the, the, perhaps the assumption about the EU target pre-2020. So we need to try and uh, adjust for these changes in the external environment, make sure our strategy is fit for purpose and to work together as a government team to try and come up with alternative proposals where those are necessary. And I certainly give the member a commitment. That's what we're, we're going to strive to do. Cara Hilton. Uh, given that emissions from transport are still, are still at 1990 levels and account for a quarter of Scotland's overall emissions, what action does the Scottish Government plan to take to have a strategic national plan for reducing car use and in particular to encourage car sharing schemes and other ways of easing traffic congestion during peak travel to work periods? Minister. Well, I, th I think um, Car Hilton is right that certainly transport has been one of the more, most difficult areas to address and certainly um, as it probably ties in with Mr McIntosh's point that where we have had a decline in economic activity, you also see a fall off in transport emissions as well. But we can probably expect as the economy picks up that the transport emissions, as people feel more wealthy and they feel more able to afford to drive, they may well increase their emissions again. So part of the challenge we've had, and it's indeed a European wide challenge, is that uh, vehicle emission standards have improved greatly. And that was anticipated to be the major uh, strategy to tackling transport emissions, but it has failed to deliver in practice because people's behavior has changed in response to that. And perhaps uh, on the same budget, they're able to drive more miles um, but uh, you know, they are perhaps using more efficient engines, but they're still pumping out the same amount of CO2 that they were um, uh, previously um, on, a, on a lower mileage. So we have not um, quite crossed that Rubicon yet, but we are investing heavily in electric vehicles as one method by which we can try and decarbonise our transport. Mr Brown, uh, as the Transport Minister, has worked closely with those involved with sustainable active travel to try and set out what the vision of sustainable active travel in Scotland might be in 2030 and work back from that in terms of the steps that are required and the funding that needs to go with that to achieve those goals. And I'm confident that we are getting good buy-in from our stakeholders now on achieving this. And I hope that by the end of this financial year, we will have up to 1,200 uh, vehicle charging points across Scotland uh, when combining Scottish and UK government funding. And hopefully that will help make it easier for people to use electric vehicles and a more rapid transition to low carbon vehicles. Thank you. That ends the statement and questions to the Minister. My apologies to the two members I could not call, but we do have to move on to our short debate, uh, which is a debate on motion number 11386 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Town Centre Action.